Meine Damen und Herren, guten Abend. Ich möchte Sie noch einmal nach gestern Abend ganz herzlich begrüßen zu den Einstein Lectures in diesem Jahr, die der Mathematik gewidmet sind und von der gemeinsam von der Albert Einstein Gesellschaft Bern und der Universität Bern durchgeführt werden, damit Sie diejenigen, die gestern nicht da waren, muss ich sagen, die haben was verpasst, aber heute wird es sicher auch gut werden, dass Frau Tretter noch einmal unseren Referenten einführt. Bitte. Ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Mathematical Institute and the University of Bern, I would like to welcome you to the Einstein Lectures 2016, to the second lecture actually. So for some of you, it may be the second time that you are here, others may be here for the first time. This is why I have put on the screen uh, the detailed introduction that I already gave yesterday of our distinguished Einstein lecturer number eight, uh, Professor Martin Heirer, who uh, holds a Regius Chair of Mathematics in Warwick and is a Fellow of the Royal Society. Now, for his uh, research on stochastic partial differential equations, and in particular his theory of regularity structures, Martin has received many, many awards, and you see a list of them above me on the screen. Uh, the culmination was, of course, in 2014, the award of the highest possible distinction for mathematicians under the year of 40. That's the distinction to the Nobel Prize, which doesn't have an age limit. <laughs> so this is the Fields Medal. And here you can see on the next slide, if it works, uh, on the left, uh, the founding document uh, for Martin's chair, actually, uh, created by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II. Uh, and on the right, you see the two sides of the Fields Medal. So uh, maybe it is interesting to know, uh, none of us has such a medal, obviously. So on the front side, uh, you can see Archimedes, and uh, uh, he is surrounded by the antique saying, uh, well, it's in Latin originally, but in German it says, den eigenen Verstand überschreiten und sich der Welt bemächtigen. It's quite a good summary of what Martin actually told us yesterday and the spirit that he gave us yesterday. Now, on the, on the back side, I think, is uh, an inc what is believed to, be, uh, to have been the engraving on Archimedes' tomb. Maybe I should also recall, uh, for special reasons today, that among the numerous distinctions, uh, Martin uh, became member of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, and that somehow Martin seems to have two souls in his breast. He is a theoretical physicist uh, who grew up in Geneva, but also an Austrian mathematician, as you may guess from the name of the audio editing software package that he wrote long ago. So uh, I don't want to steal much more of your time, Martin. We are very much looking forward to your second, maybe more scientific, Einstein lecture. Please. So, uh, thank you very much again. Um, yeah, so, I mean, my understanding was that the second lecture was intended for a sort of more scientific, uh, specialized audience. Uh, so the intended audience for this lecture is basically mathematicians. Um, but, I mean, hopefully some of it will also appeal to non-mathematicians, but it's mainly intended as a lecture for mathematicians. The lecture tomorrow will again be a more general public uh, kind of lecture like the one yesterday. So, the, uh, so what I want to talk about today, it's somehow, it's essentially a more uh, focused piece of mathematics. Um, 
and it's actually based on joint work with several co-authors here. It's somehow, it's a series of articles. Um, and the, uh, our aim there was to actually build a, somehow a, a very natural object, a very natural random object which hadn't been built before. And so I want to explain today a bit what that object is and uh, how you go about building it. Okay. Um, and so, so the sort of situation that you should have in mind is something like a rubber band. Okay, so take a bit of, imagine that you have somehow a piece of rubber and you wrap it around uh, some surface. So you have a surface which can have a more or less arbitrary shape. Um, and you, you wrap your piece of rubber around the surface and you make sure that it actually really you know, follows the surface so it's not allowed to go off the surface. So it has to really lie on the surface like this. Um, and then if you put the rubber band on the surface and you let it go, of course it's going to try to shrink, right? And so what would happen here um, if you let it go, probably it would sort of shrink down here, right? And then after a while, it would stay uh, down there, and it would form what's called a geodesic, or a closed geodesic, which would be this curve down here at the waist. Um, and so there is, a, there is a mathematical model for this kind of evolution, uh, which is sometimes called the length, length shortening flow. Okay, so, but you should really think of somehow a rubber band trying to shrink as much as possible. So sometimes it might be able to completely shrink to a point. So if you think of something like a sphere, right? if you put a rubber band on a sphere and you, it really stay, has to stay on the sphere and the rubber band is sort of an infinitely elastic rubber band, right? So it doesn't have an intrinsic length if you want. So it really tries to become as small as possible. And so eventually it would just shrink down to a point. Uh, whereas here it couldn't, right? It would sort of shrink down to this waist and then it cannot shrink any further. Okay? It would stay there. Um, so, so the way you would model this mathematically is that any, so a rubber band, you can view it just as a function that goes from the circle into this surface, which in mathematics is called a manifold. Um, and to any such function, there is a natural way of assigning an energy which is really something like the potential energy of that piece of rubber band. Um, and well, here's the formula for this energy. And so those of you who are a bit familiar with differential geometry would probably recognize this formula here. Um, but those of you who are more from a physical background, you can really think of it as the potential energy of the rubber band. It's the same thing. Um, and so what you try is you try to minimize this, right? So the, if you want a one-dimensional cartoon, is something like this. If you have a, so, so now imagine a situation where instead of having this complicated rubber band, you just have a point uh, which runs along a one-dimensional line, and there is an energy, which is this function, and so at some locations the energy is big, and then some location it's small, then here it's bigger again, here it's smaller, here it's bigger. Um, and so if you try to, so here the natural evolution in this energy is, you know, imagine sort of a little ball. Now, the evolution that you should imagine is not the one of somehow a ball rolling down this surface, right? So if you let this ball roll down, it would do, you know, something like this, and it will kind of go back and forth. You should, should think more of an evolution like what you would do if you hike down a mountain, Right, so you have a mountain. Um, if you want to get down the mountain, well, you would essentially just walk down, well, depends if there's no path. Uh, the easiest way is to actually just walk down straight. Right? And straight, what does it mean straight? It means that at every point you look at where it's actually steepest and you go down in that direction. Okay? Uh, and the speed at which you go down, well, the steeper, the faster. Okay? And so this is described by this differential equation here, which says that the variation in position is equal to this derivative of this energy function. And this derivative is really what somehow tells you in which direction it goes down 
well, it tells you in which direction it goes up, but then you change the sign, and so it tells you in which direction it goes down. Right? Um, and so if you do the same thing for this rubber band, you get something like this. So imagine that you have this rubber band, which it takes values in a sphere now. Okay, so here you start off with this funny shape, like this. Um, and now you try to make this energy uh, go down, and it looks something like this. Okay, so you see that it, so the first thing that you see is that at the beginning it had corners, and then it immediately gets smooth. Okay? And you also see that it, you know, it starts to look more and more like a circle. Um, and then actually what happens, okay, so here I stop the movie, but if you let the movie run, you know, if you let it run forever, this circle would just get smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller and would eventually just shrink down to a point, right? So that's somehow this rubber band trying to shrink indefinitely and on the sphere there's nothing that prevents it uh, from shrinking down forever. Okay, so this is um, a very natural uh, evolution. And so mathematically, this is described by what's called a partial differential equation. And well, so for those of you who know a bit about differential geometry in local coordinates, you get a differential equation that looks like this. But so, so this U here is, if you think of it as the position of this rubber band. And now it depends on two things, right? It depends on time, but it also depends, well, the rubber band itself is a whole band, so it depends on where you are on the band, right? So then you have a point on your surface uh, for every instant of time and for every position along that rubber band, okay? And so that's described by this function u here, which depends on two coordinates, which is t and x. So t is the time coordinate, and x is the one that just goes along this rubber band. Um, and, well, so here you have an equation like this, which somehow tells you, so the first part of the equation is something that we've actually seen yesterday, which was this heat equation, which we already talked about yesterday. And so here it's actually the position of the points of, on this rubber band that evolve according to something that looks a bit like this heat equation, but it has some additional, more complicated terms. Um, so this evolution was actually introduced by Ease and Samson in the mid-60s, so that goes back a long time, in, even in a more uh, general framework. Um, and it's a, you know, this is a very well, very well studied object. Now, what, what I'm interested in is usually is probability theory, and so my, I'm interested in you know, random motion. So here there was nothing random, right? So you just take this rubber band and it shrinks down to a point. Um, now, in general, in physics, when you have one of these energy function, then there is a natural probability measure that is associated to it, which is called the Gibbs measure, um, which depends on this energy function. It also depends, in general, it depends on the temperature. So here I set the temperature to be one in some arbitrary units, um, which tells you that somehow if you have a, a physical system that's described by a certain energy and you somehow put it into contact uh, with a heat bath, so you somehow want to introduce some kind of notion of temperature, um, then what happens is that the probability that you see, so mathematically temperature or heat is typically modeled by something random, right? So we've seen yesterday this Brownian motion, um, which was really this random motion, uh, which was produced by water molecules hitting little particles in suspension in a liquid. And the temperature here is really somehow the speed of these particles that hit, you know, the so pollen grain, say, in suspension in the liquid. And so zero, at zero temperature, you would not see any of these motions, okay? So the fact that you have this erratic motion is really somehow a signature of 
having some non-zero temperature. And so in general, when you have a physical system that's described by some energy uh, and you want to put it at a certain temperature, then the probability of seeing it in a certain state is proportional to the exponential of minus the energy of that state, and then divided by the Boltzmann constant and the temperature, and I just set this to one. Um, and so in this particular case, we take the same energy function as before, which was this energy function here, and then e to the minus this energy function would be some kind of shape like this. And then what it tells you is that if you have a system which is described by um, this energy function here, well, there's a high, you know, there's a large likelihood to find it uh, somewhere around here, around this point. That's, a, that's where this likelihood here is maximal. But then it's also relatively likely to find it somewhere around here, and it's very unlikely to find it somewhere out there in the tails. Okay, so this function here describes somehow the, the likelihood of finding the system in a given state. And mathematically, one can describe this. So here, you know, so in the previous slide, uh, we had this red dot. The natural motion of the red dot is to just to go down the hill until it cannot go down any further. Right? So that was on, on this slide here. The natural evolution of this red dot, if it follows this equation, is to just slide down. And then down here, well, there's nowhere to go further down anymore. And so it just stays where it is. Okay? Um, now, when you want to introduce a temperature, um, if you want the natural motion, it's basically the same motion as before, but imagine now furthermore, there are some there are sort of surrounding particles or molecules or whatever you want to call them uh, that knock this red ball around. And so it doesn't actually just slide down gently and then stay where it is, but it actually keeps on being knocked around. Okay? And somehow the higher the temperature, the stronger it gets knocked around. Um, and so it doesn't end up just sliding down and staying here, but it keeps on making some kind of erratic motion. Uh, but of course, it typically cannot go too far, right? So what this probability distribution here tells you somehow where you are likely to find it. So it tells you, for example, it will never go out really far because you know, maybe the surrounding molecules also try to push it somewhere to the left, but then here it gets very steep, so it doesn't want to go further up, and so it keeps on being pushed down, and so most of the time you're going to find it in these regions. And so now you can do, you can ask yourself, is there a natural, you know, so we had these two motions, so there's the simple motion of just gliding down the potential, and then there's this more uh, complicated random motion where you introduce a notion of temperature. And the question is there now an analog of this random motion for our rubber band. Okay, so you can uh, plug this into a computer, you get something like this. So this is somehow the analogous random motion for this rubber band. Um, and so you see it is a bit like, it's some sort of random analog of what we saw before. Okay, so you see that essentially it tries to again shrink to a point, uh, but this time it doesn't succeed because there is temperature, so there's randomness that keeps on pushing it around, and so it never quite shrinks down to a point. It actually keeps on, you know, if, if you let the movie run for longer, it would always more or less look like this, and it would just wobble around and sort of move around the sphere in a random way. Um, and so what we wanted to do is build a mathematical object that uh, describes this motion. Um, so of course you'd say, well, you know, I just showed you a movie, uh, so obviously this mathematical object exists because here it is. Um, but well, of course the movie is only some kind of approximation, right? And so the a priori, it's not clear whether, you know, so in order to produce this movie, I had to simulate some kind of discrete or finite version of my rubber band. So what I do is instead of having an 
continuous rubber band. I sort of you know, break it into many little pieces, and then I just simulate each piece. And then it's not clear whether, you know, if I break it into more and more and more and more pieces, whether, you know, the movies, I would get different movies, and then the question is, do they all look the same, or do they not all look the same, right? So the question is, do they really converge to some limiting movie uh, as the discretization sort of gets finer and finer, uh, or do they not? Okay, and so the what we wanted to show is that there is really a limiting movie as somehow the simulation here suggests. And this is true not just for the sphere, but it's true for any surface of any shape and any dimension. So it doesn't just have to be a two-dimensional surface, it could be a higher dimensional analog. So, so we want to have a natural way of adding noise to this equation, right? And so if you think of it again as a discrete version, so think of the rubber band as being really just finitely many beads uh, that are connected by little springs, okay? And each spring uh, can store a certain amount of potential energy, and that's somehow the total energy of all of these springs is the energy of your rubber band, okay? Um, and so now, the evolution that you want to look at for this discrete version is, well, the analog of the evolution we had before, where the rubber band just tries to shrink as much as possible to a point to make its length as short as possible. Um, but then furthermore, we want to add, you know, some noisy random term to each of these beads. And here, the most natural way uh, to add the noise, the one which somehow, at least at some formal level, uh, would lead to this equilibrium measure, which is this natural Gibbs measure, uh, would be the one where for each of the beads, uh, you push them around randomly and you push them around randomly in independent ways. Okay, so the noise that pushes this bead around is completely independent from the one that pushes this bead around, which is independent from the one that pushes that one around, et cetera, et cetera. And, well, then you see it's not, comp then it's really not clear whether there is a continuum limit of this, right? Because if you had a continuum limit, it means you have somehow a continuum of these beads, so you have sort of infinitely many, one at every point, and all of them get pushed around essentially in independent ways, so you would think maybe this sort of rips apart this rubber band instantly. But on the other hand, from the movie, it looks like it doesn't happen, even though one thing that you see is that it looks very irregular, right? It somehow, it doesn't look like it got ripped apart, but, you know, it doesn't look very nice and smooth either. And it, and it sort of moves really fast, right? So it's somehow, it, it wants to be ripped apart, but then because of the rubber, because of these springs that keep the beads together, somehow it never quite succeeds in ripping it apart, okay? And so that's what we want to understand, sort of the competition between these effects. Um, so, Mathematically, um, what it means here, so the natural way of, so you put these independent noises, but then you still have to choose sort of how strong these noises should be or in which direction they should push you. Um, and then again, on this surface, you want to choose this in a way which is in some sense sort of compatible with this surface. Um, and mathematically, the way you would do this is to choose somehow finitely many vector field, so a vector field is just a way of choosing a direction at every point of the surface. Um, and then you add noises in the directions of all these vector fields, and you choose these vector fields in such a way that when you sum them up, or sort of sum their squares viewed as, uh, as derivations, uh, then you get an operator which is called the Laplace Beltrami operator, which is somehow a natural object that's of determines the local structure of this surface. So this is, this is really just somehow the natural way uh, of choosing, if you want, the, the direction or the shape of this ellipsoid here 
which somehow tells you how strong the noise is, right? So this ellipsoid somehow tells you that the noise sort of pushes you a little bit more in this direction than in this direction, okay? And so it's a completely round one. You would want to choose it somehow round at every point, but then you have to you have to have the the correct notion of being round in some sense, okay? So it's somehow when you define what you mean by a surface mathematically, it's not completely clear what you mean by round here, and this is essentially what you mean. Um, so, so the discussion so far basically tells you that the equation that you want to give a meaning of is, well, this equation here, which is the same as before, so this term is just some sort of shorthand uh, for the deterministic part of the evolution, which is just sort of the rubber band trying to collapse to a point. Um, and then there is a random part which involves uh, these noises, and these noises should be really independent at every point on the rubber band, and they should also be independent at every instant of time. So it really somehow pushes you the noise pushes you around randomly, as randomly as possible, if you want. Okay, and so mathematically it means that uh, these random field which describes somehow the noise that pushes the rubber band around um, has a correlation structure of this type here where this delta function really just means it's always zero except if the arguments are the same. And so, so it just means that things are independent, if you take any two points that are different at different points in space and in time, the noises are completely independent there. And so the question is, does this, you know, does this equation have any sort of meaning? Right? Is there a way of giving a meaning to this equation? And so the problem here is that, well, we've seen, we've done a simulation, right? So we've plugged this into a computer uh, we see what it looks like. It looks like something like this. Um, and you see that this curve certainly is not smooth at any point, right? So it certainly doesn't look like it has nice tangents uh, at any point. Um, but if we write down this equation, um, then the right-hand side involves actually the derivatives of the solution, but the solution doesn't have any derivatives, okay? And so it looks like we wrote down an equation that actually in the limit uh, just does not have any meaning at all, right? So, of course, what we can do is we can try to give it a meaning in the pragmatic way, right? So the pragmatic way is somehow plug it into the computer and make the approximation better and better. Uh, so one way of emulating this mathematically is to say, you see, the problem, the reason why things become very irregular is because this noise is supposed to be such that at any two points in space-time, the noise acts in an independent way, right? And so it sort of really tends to rip things apart. Um, and so what you can do is you can say, well, instead of making it act in an independent way at any two points, I make it act in an independent way at any two points that are more than some very small distance apart. Okay, so I just choose a very small distance, uh, which I call epsilon, because mathematicians always call small things epsilon. And so what I do is I replace this noise, which was supposed to be completely independent for any two point, uh, by something which has the property that if two points are more than epsilon away from each other, then you see something independent. But if they are less than epsilon away from each other, well, it's not independent, but it's actually nice and it varies in a nice and smooth way. Okay, and then there is absolutely no problem of giving a meaning uh, to the solution to this equation. And then you can ask yourself, you know, sort of the question of whether this movie has a sort of limiting movie uh, as we try to make the approximation better and better, um, it's the same as the question of do the solutions to this equation converge to some limiting solution as this small number epsilon goes to zero? Okay, and so our theorem is that, well, indeed, uh, 
they converge to a limiting, uh, uh, they converge to a limit as epsilon goes to zero. And furthermore, this limit is, it does not depend too much on, you know, the way in which you approximate this idealized noise where things are independent for any two space-time points. Okay, so here you have to somehow specify um, how do you make it nice and smooth at distances less than epsilon, and so you have to make choices here. Uh, and in principle, you can think, well, maybe uh, the limit that you obtain depends on these choices. Okay? And so what we can show is that if the uh, surface has, for example, some nice symmetries, like the sphere, uh, then the limit is completely independent of these choices. And if it doesn't have any nice symmetries, so if it's just a completely arbitrary, funny-shaped surface, um, then we don't know whether the limit, so in general, we believe the limit might depend uh, on the details, but we know that it doesn't depend on them too much. And there's somehow a precise mathematical way of saying what we mean by not too much. Um, in some sense, it depends only on finitely many features of this function which you choose here. Um, so, right, so this is what I mentioned here. Now, it's very important, so in this, the fact that this converges is somehow a very peculiar fact of somehow the geometry of this, uh, of this problem, in the sense that if you write down an equation somewhat of the same type, exactly the same kind of equation, um, but with terms that do not come from a nice geometry, um, then in general this, the statement, the conclusion of the theorem that I mentioned on the previous slide is false. Okay, so in the equation on the right hand side, if you write down the equation, there are terms that come uh, from the geometry of the surface. And so there's some compatibility between these terms that comes from the fact that both of them come from the same surface. Uh, and if this is lost, then in general, this convergence just doesn't hold. Um, so there is a somehow more general, uh, in general, we can fix this but then it means you have to actually start to look at a sequence of equations where you add terms on the right-hand side which themselves go to infinity. Um, and then this creates cancellations which means that the solutions still converge. So there is some subtle cancellations that, you're, that one wants to understand. Um, so why, so why is it difficult um, to show this kind of convergence. Well, you can write down somehow the equation, and then you can ask yourself, in some sense, how large are the different terms that appear on the right-hand side? And so the problem, so you see, so first you've, you see that on the right-hand side you have these terms that appear which involve derivatives. So this is the derivative of the solution in the direction of you know, the coordinate that goes along the rubber band. And this we are, we've already seen that, well, you don't expect this rubber band to form a nice smooth function, so it will actually not have a derivative at any point. Okay? And so these terms here are just not going to be any nice function in the limit, but they will be something that one calls distributions. And one can estimate the size of these terms um, as this small parameter epsilon goes to zero. And what one finds is that these terms are typically of size, well, this basically means that these are actually of size about epsilon to the, mi to the power minus one half. So they are of size one over square root of epsilon. So if epsilon is very small, then square root of epsilon is very small, and so one over this is very large. Right, so this is going to be very large for very small values of epsilon, and then they get multiplied, so it gets even larger. Um, and this term here is the noise term, which is actually even larger. So it's of the order uh, one over epsilon to the power three halves. So 
none of these terms actually converges to a nice functions uh, as epsilon goes to zero. Um, the hope is that they would still converge to limits in you know, what mathematicians call in the sense of distribution, so that's some kind of a generalization of the notion of functions that mathematicians come up with. But then the problem with these distributions is that you're in general not allowed to multiply them with each other, okay? So if you have two functions, well, functions have a no, you can just evaluate them at points, uh, and therefore you can always multiply them. Uh, with distributions, you cannot evaluate them at points. You can only somehow average them out uh, over little uh, volumes. Um, and so since you cannot evaluate them at points, you cannot actually multiply them. So this is not completely true. So you know, there are still, your, it's possible, for example, to multiply distributions with functions as long as the functions are nice enough. Uh, but in this case, in all of these products, so the products that are showed as somehow red big dots, um, the objects that appear are way too irregular so that their product has a meaning um, in the sort of classical analytical sense. Um, so, let me just sort of give a few remarks on the history of this problem. So, there are some, so actually Funake uh, from Tokyo, so he considered this problem back in the 90s already, but then, well, at the time, somehow the technology used to tackle this didn't exist, and so um, in the end he had to somewhat abandon uh, the hope of constructing this object. Um, there is even the question of just making sense of simply the snapshot here, right? So not the movie, but just what you see if you run the movie for an sort of infinite amount of time, and then you just take a snapshot, which is what you see here. Um, and so making sense of just this object here without the dynamic part uh, is a somewhat easier problem. And so this was actually tackled somehow in the 80s and 90s, and so people managed to make sense of this at that time. Um, then there, is some, there are some recent theories that were developed by people somehow in the last couple of years um, that were designed to tackle precisely these type of problems. Um, but they don't seem to apply to you know, this particular problem, uh, which I mentioned here. And then in the way of trying to understand this, so even though this looks very much like a problem of analysis or probability theory, it's a sort of relatively concrete problem, um, but in the process of analyzing this problem, one actually encounters a number of algebraic structures uh, that are relatively sophisticated. And so these algebraic structures, they were actually studied by Kohn and Kreimer about 15 years ago um, in a completely different context. So they studied these structures in the context of quantum field theory. Uh, but they are almost exactly the same structures that appear here. Um, if we maybe see a little bit more about that later. Um, so, so what's the main idea? So how, how does one prove from how a convergence result like this? So the main problem we've seen um, is the fact that, well, solutions are very irregular. And because they are very irregular, some terms in the equation happen to be somehow distributions and not functions. And therefore, some of these products here are ill-posed. So what one can try to do is one can try to make some kind of guess of what the solutions look like. So one would try to find some sort of description of the solution, uh, which is good enough um, so that it allows us to give a definition of these products. 
Now, if you have nice and smooth functions, the standard way in which we locally describe a nice and smooth function is by what's called a Taylor expansion. Okay, so a Taylor expansion, it essentially says, well, a smooth function can be quite well approximated by a polynomial. Right? So if you want to, to lowest order, a smooth function can be approximated by its value at a point. But then if you want a slightly better approximation, you can look at its tangent. Right? So the tangent would sort of how follow it closer for a bit longer. But then if you want an even better approximation, you can try to fit it with a parabola. And that's even better than the tangent. And you can go to you know, polynomials of degree three, four, et cetera. So you can approximate smooth functions in this way by polynomials. Um, and in this case, well, the solutions are not smooth at all, so it's just not a good idea to locally describe them by polynomials, right? So they don't have uh, any kind of derivative. And so the idea is to try to generalize this notion of Taylor expansion, or somehow of expanding a function into a polynomial, by trying to make a much more educated guess of what the solution would actually look like, and then try to expand it in some objects that are not polynomials, but that are objects that actually do look like the solution itself. Okay. Um, so to highest order, what you could do is you can, well, you know, I told you about how big these terms were. So I told you that this term is about one over square root of epsilon. So the product here is about size one over epsilon. This is about order one. Uh, and this term here is about one over epsilon to the three half. And so this term is much bigger for small values epsilon than this one. Um, so one educated guess that you could make is that to highest order, to first order for very small values of epsilon, you can simply neglect this term, this whole term in the middle. Um, and then for this term here, well, this here involves the solution itself, which although it looks very irregular, it still looks like it's a continuous function in the limit. And so a continuous function, you can basically approximate it around the location by its value. And so I can simply replace this by its value at a given point. And then the equation that stands here is essentially a multiple of this equation here, which is a much simpler equation, which is a linear equation for which one has explicit solutions. And then one can say, well, I would expect the solution, at least locally, around the point, to pretty much look like uh, the solution to this linear equation. Right, because at least for small epsilon, the largest term on the right-hand side is this one. Um, and so I would just take this dominant term here and try to approximate the solution by this. And then the hope would be that, you know, if it's true that the solution locally looks like uh, the solution to this equation here, or the correct linear combination of solutions to this equation here. Um, and if I know how to define these various products here for the solution to that much simpler equation, then maybe that's enough to actually define them for the real solution. Right? So the hope is that although these terms appear to not really have any meaning, if I can somehow give them a meaning for a much simpler object, which on the other hand, I guess, to look like the more complicated object I'm after, uh, then maybe these products also make sense for the more complicated object. Right? Um, now, that's the idea, but, well, unfortunately, it doesn't quite work in this way. Um, but some kind of higher order version of this idea works. Okay, so it's in the same sense that this would be a little bit like the analog of some first order Taylor expansion, right? Where this is the value of the solution at the point, and then you say, well, around this point xt, we expect that the solution somehow looks like its value 
plus uh, this linear combination of the increments of the solution to this equation here. And this is very much like a Taylor expansion, where you say that the value of a function around a point uh, looks like the value at the point plus the slope times the slope at the point times you know, just a linear function. So you replace the function by uh, its tangent at the point. Except that here, instead of writing something like a tangent, uh, we replace the linear function by this object here, which is itself random and the solution to uh, this linear equation. So we can, we can make some sort of shorthand from this notation. So what turns out to be is that you have, some, you have to, to do a higher order version of this. So instead of doing a first order approximation of the solution, you have to do a you know, better order approximation uh, until it becomes somehow good enough uh, that the whole thing closes. So if I, so what I do here is I introduce some sort of graphical notation. So if I write a circle here for the noise, which is this psi, and then I write a straight line for the heat kernel, which really means solve this equation here. So the solution to this equation is the psi itself uh, convolved with the heat kernel. And then I also introduce the notion, this red line for the derivative of the heat kernel, which appears later on. Then this long identity here, I can write it as a very, very short identity here. Okay, so this here is now just a shortcut uh, for this identity here, right? So you see that this identity says that the value at the point is equal, the value in a little air region is equal to the value at the point in the middle plus this sigma of u times this increment of v, and v is heat kernel convolved with noise. So noise convolved with heat kernel, I write it as noise, which is this little circle with a little straight line going down, which represents convolution with the heat kernel. And so this long line we had on the previous slide becomes just this very, very short expression. Okay? And so then you can try to make better guesses. And so it turns out if you make a better guess, you, know, you end up with a term that somehow looks like this. And then you make even better guess and even better guess. And by the time you get to I don't know, 12 or 13 terms like this, um, then you actually have a good enough guess of what the solutions should look like around every point um, so that if you can give consistently a meaning to all of these products that appeared in the right-hand side of this equation, with the solution rep replaced by all of these objects here that are encoded by these little pictures, um, then indeed you have enough information to also consistently give a meaning for all of these products for the solution itself. Okay? Um, so that's, that's somehow the idea of how you build a solution theory for these equations by making an educated guess of what the solutions should look like around every point. Um, and you have to go to relatively high order for this. And then you have a number of random functions or distributions that appear in this way that describe uh, the local behavior of the solution, and you say locally it should have something like a Taylor expansion, but where the polynomials are replaced by these objects uh, described by these little pictures. And then you say that if all these operations that don't really have a meaning happen to make sense somehow for these objects, then they would also make sense for the solution itself. And then you can somehow you can make, do this in a self-consistent way. Uh, and you can control everything as epsilon goes to zero. Now, for the physicists in the audience, this might look a little bit like Feynman diagrams, um, and indeed, that's somehow not a coincidence of what it is somewhat similar to 
uh, the Feynman diagrams that appear in quantum field theory. Um, now, the problem that one ends up with is that actually, well, these products that you want to define between all of these objects, well, they are themselves, it's somehow problematic to define them, right? So you take these objects themselves, they have approximations as epsilon goes to zero. Um, and then you would hope that, you know, the products of their derivatives and so on, maybe by some miracle that they would converge to some limits. And then you can define this limit to be uh, the corresponding product. And unfortunately, it turns out that they don't. Right? And so in general, uh, the products, say, of some derivatives of these objects happen to diverge as this parameter epsilon goes to zero. And so it appears that this whole procedure is actually useless because these objects themselves don't converge to any limit. Um, and so, yes, yes, that's fine. So if you're in zero curvature, there's a number of things that drop, yeah, yes. Um, so, well, pretty much all of it drops. So in zero curvature, it's the, the thing is not so interesting. Um, so what you want to do is in order to force these objects to converge, what you want to do is in some sense you want to change the definition of the product. So you want to change the definition of some of these products in a consistent way in order to force these objects to converge. Um, but then the question is, you know, are you allowed to do this? Okay, so if you're, and what does it then mean? Right? If you somehow suddenly start to change the definition of what you mean by the product between two of these functions, um, it looks like you have no chance of you know, proving the original statement. So the original statement didn't make any kind of reference to these objects. It just said, I take the equation that I start with, I somehow make this noise nice and smooth, and then I remove this regularization, and I claim that the solutions that you obtain in this way converge to a limit. And I didn't say anything about changing the definition of products, okay? And so in the statement there, there's the product is the absolutely perfectly normal product. Okay? Um, but the idea is to still, at this stage, to actually change the definition of the product um, in order to force these objects to converge. And, well, it turns out that it's possible to do this, um, but, the, uh, but you, have to, you have to ask yourself, in some sense, what are the modifications of the product that you're allowed to perform, uh, which are still consistent, in some sense, with its interpretation as a product. And so for this, one has to sort of dive a little more into the structure of these objects. And so the fact that all of these objects that appear here, they are some sort of generalized versions of, really generalized versions of increments of these objects. So as you see on the previous slide, here the term that appeared was really not the solution to this function itself, but the increment uh, of the solution to this equation. And for the higher order objects, there's some kind of higher order analog of this notion of increment. And what is crucial for the theory is that Somehow, if you modify the definition of the product, um, your modified product should still not destroy um, this notion of increment. Um, and so, what you can what you can do here is you can uh, you can describe these increments that appear by you know, a certain algebraic structure that acts on these little pictures. 
Okay, so you can view, so these little pictures, you can, you know, formalize them, and you, you can cook up some um, mathematical formalism that uh, describes these little pictures. And then there is a natural, so this recentering procedure, or this increment procedure, is described by um, some, some group of transformations that act on you know, the space spanned by these little pictures, which is in some sense the analog. It's the analog of the space of polynomials, where when you perform a Taylor expansion of a function, well, if you perform a Taylor expansion around the point x0, you write this Taylor expansion not as a polynomial in x, but you write it as a polynomial in x minus x0. Right? So you write the tangent as somehow the value of the function at the point x0 plus the slope times x minus x0 plus the second derivative times x minus x0 squared, etc. Um, and so this notion of Sort of recentering things. So that the reason why you do this right, is that in, such a, in this way, the different terms in your expansion have well-defined behavior at the point x0. Okay, so the, the slope, the linear function x minus x0 vanishes when x is equal to x0, and it vanishes at order 1. Now, x minus x0 squared vanishes at order 2. Now here, each of these little pictures has a natural notion of degree that goes with it, and you want to define the corresponding objects in such a way that they also vanish in an order which corresponds to their degree, so that they can be used then in a way which is very similar uh, to the way that you use Taylor expansions. Okay. Um, and just in the way that, you know, simply the group of translations acts on the polynomials uh, to make them vanish at a given point, right? So the way you change the point x0 is by simply translating your polynomials around. Um, here there's an analogous group which has a more complicated structure that acts uh, on these little pictures and that has the effect of recentering them uh, around different points in such a way that the corresponding objects vanish at an order which corresponds to their degrees. Um, and so now what you would want is um, you want to make a change of the definition of what it means to multiply two of these objects, but you want to change this definition in a way which is consistent uh, with this operation of translating, or if you want, of changing the point around which you perform the expansion. Um, and so the question there is, you know, what kind of deformations, or how are you allowed to change the definition of your product in such a way that things remain consistent? Um, and then the main question, of course, is, is there a way you know, if you figure out how you're allowed to change the definition of your product, is there an, a way to change it in such a way that the objects that appeared in this expansion actually happen to converge to limits, right? So you want to change the definition of the products that appear in such a way that you force them to converge to limits. And it's not clear, right, that there's sufficient freedom, if you want, to be able to do this. Um, and then even if you're able to do this, what you want to do then at the end is to go back to the problem that you started from and to say, well, if I now change the definition of the product in my problem, have I actually changed the problem that I'm looking at, right? So a priori, you might have completely destroyed the original problem, right? Because you simply said so the original problem had a perfectly honest to God normal product standing there. You replace it by something weird. Um, it might be that you actually completely destroyed the meaning of the original problem. Um, it turns out that in this particular case, the correct way of modding, modifying the product has the effect that, indeed, 
when you go back to, to the original problem, you have the impression that it completely changes the original problem. Um, but what you realize then is that although it turns the original problem into a problem that appears to be different, well, the new problem differs from the old one by a whole bunch of new terms that get added to the equation, and they happen to all cancel each other out. Okay, so even though it appears that you've completely changed the equation, so in particular, each of the terms, you know, there were two terms on the right-hand side of the equation, and both of them had somehow no meaning a priori. So both of them get replaced by something completely different. But if you look at the sum of them, all the things, the new terms that get added, they all happen to cancel each other out. And so the, the equation as a whole actually remains completely unchanged. And so it means that at the end of the day, you still happen to actually have solved the original problem and not a different problem. Okay. Um, and so I think so that was somehow the explanation of how this works, but I just skip over it, so those sort of in words. And so I think I'll stop here, and thank you very much for your attention. Sorry, uh, technical problem. Thank you very much again for this uh, lecture. Uh, I think everybody would agree that it was a bit tougher stuff than yesterday, but uh, there may still be questions. Yes. Um, hi. Uh, so, you mentioned Taylor expansion, and there's something I always wondered about this. It seems that um, the way you expand, I mean, this strategy does apply to other equations as well, or doesn't it? Uh, it does apply to some other equations as well, yeah. But the, it seems that the way you expand does depend on the equation. Yes. Okay, so that's... Uh, it depends on the class of equations. Yeah. I see. But, yeah, it and depends on the equation. The other thing is... I mean, when you expand a function, any C infinity function is expanded in, in Taylor's series. And I have the impression that this is valid for the solution. I, you expand the solution. Is well, there any meaning of expanding any other function or object? The thing is that there is a notion of smooth function that comes with it. Mm -hmm. But it's just that smooth doesn't mean smooth anymore, right? So the smooth in this sense doesn't mean smooth in your sense anymore, right? So, it's in the, so when you say, you see, when you say that the C infinity function has a Taylor expansion, it's almost like a tautology, because what does it mean to be C infinity? It means that you have a Taylor expansion. Right? Um, and so here it's somehow the same thing. So when you, you build this notion of a Taylor expansion, which is different from the usual notion, and then comes with it a notion of a smooth function, which is different from the usual notion. Right? And so then, again, if you want every smooth function has a Taylor expansion, it's a sort of tautology. It's just that it's more difficult here to figure out what you actually mean by smooth, because it's not the usual meaning of smooth anymore. Um, but then the way you build solutions here, for example, if you, you set it up as a Picard iteration, you set up a fixed point problem in some space of smooth functions. And so then it's not just the solution itself that has an expansion, right? So it would be every term in that iteration, for example. Right? So you built the solution as a limit of smooth functions in this sense, and each of them has an expansion, and they are themselves not the solutions themselves. So thank you very much for that talk. Um, I have a question concerning the noise. So how essential is your assumption of Gaussianity to the noise? Can you get beyond uh, Gaussian noise? Yeah. It's, uh, it's not essential. Um, it's so, in, so we're currently, yeah, okay, so 
say it's not essential. Um, so the, somehow the proofs that we have at the moment, they tend to require relatively high moment assumptions. Uh, but the fact that it's actually Gaussian is not really essential. So it's somehow very natural here, but, uh, but it's not essential. No. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for the nice uh, overview you've presented. I have a question on the uh, temperature that you're going to uh, that you define, and you haven't shown us essentially the, the smoothed out movie of how the rubber band now really would ex look like in a uh, smoothed out fashion. And I was wondering whether the rubber band, the movie that we create, would resemble a movie that you simply would do with your uh, edgy rubber band that you have shown us, if you simply would smooth that out by integrating over small pieces and uh, make that, in a poor man's way, smoother? Um, yes, it would resemble that. Uh, it would not be identical to that, but yes, it would. I mean, so in some sense, this proves that it would resemble that, right? Um, so. Uh, so yes, and you can actually make that more precise in the sense that it, it resembles it resembles this more than just by the fact that both of them actually resemble the limit, right? So I mean, so uh, so yes. Yeah, so there's a, you know th this whole approximation procedure and sort of this local description. Well, the whole point is that this is true also at fixed values of epsilon, and it's sort of the, all the controls are uniform in epsilon. And so you know exactly what it looks like for fixed value of epsilon, and it tells you exactly what you said, which is that somehow it essentially looks like a smoothened version of the movie that I showed you. I mean, the movie that I showed you, of course, is also fixed epsilon. It's just a, it's a very small fixed epsilon. <laughs> the final spot size that you get must be temperature dependent. Sorry, the, the final spot size that you get when you're at the infinite evolution time, you get some temperature dependent uh, surface area of your rubber band. Surface? Well, the, the, the spot that you have in the end, the, the, the rubber band does not shrink to a point. It shrinks right. to some finite volume, finite size, finite surface. Yes. This must be noise dependent or temperature dependent? Yes. So, yes, oh, okay, I see what you mean. Yes, that's right. So, somehow, the, the lower the temperature, the smaller that blob would be. Yeah, that's right. Um, and so, you can, I mean, you can figure out somehow yeah. about the size of the diameter in terms, I mean, it's a simple figure. I, I don't know the answer by heart, but there's a simple power law of, you know, the size of the diameter as a function of the temperature, sure. Um. Thank you for this very nice talk. Um, I had a question about compactly supported uh, kernels and how essential they are uh, in your construct. Because we know that they are more and more constrained when the dimension increases. So I was wondering if it was affecting your, your construction. Um, no. So first, the fact that I approximate this delta function by a compactly supported kernel uh, is not essential at all, so it just makes life easier, but it's, uh, it's really not essential. Um, but on the other hand, here the fact that the target manifold is finite dimensional is kind of essential, so I don't really know for good analog construction where the target manifold would be infinite dimensional. Um, quantum field theories suffer from uh, ultraviolet divergences which must be regularized and then renormalized and then the question arises with whether this can be done beyond perturbation theory. Can your techniques perhaps be used to prove rigorously the existence of some quantum field theories? Uh, I mean, in that sense, this is also somewhat perturbative. Okay. Uh, mm -hmm. Right, I mean, sort of. I mean, this looks similar to a you know, perturbative expansion in quantum field theory. 
uh, it looks somewhat different in the sense that in quantum field theory, you would have the coefficients here would just be numbers, right? They would be constant, whereas here they are themselves functions which are actually part of the solution. Uh, so in that sense, it's somehow non-perturbative, right? So there's a non-perturbative aspect that you would all build solutions as a solution to a fixed point problem and not actually just as an asymptotic expansion or so. And you really get an object in the end and not just something asymptotic. Um, but in the other sense that somehow you mentioned, this is really still perturbative. Okay, so, so it's somehow essential here that uh, the noise part is really the dominant part in, you know, in terms of scaling behavior. And so if you want the analog would be something like um, super renormalizable quantum field theories. I would like to relate a little bit to a remark that you made in yesterday's talk about Amar Bose and his noise canceling headphones. Um, these more, the more advanced understanding of noise, uh, has it helped in any way for the more recent improvements, say, for example, in noise cancellation of hearing aids or so? I mean, does the mathematics somehow help for it? Uh, so this, I don't know. So I have no idea how the algorithms work in these. Uh, and it's probably not public knowledge, actually, I would guess. <laughs> they are probably proprietary algorithms, so, <laughs> so it might be difficult to figure that out. <laughs> so, um, I, I was wondering uh, how the solutions look like for uh, special uh, uh, examples, like if you run uh, your solution as epsilon goes to zero on a sphere or on a torus, do you have a more exact description of uh, the limiting um, solution that you get? Um, well, okay, so locally you know that they will always somewhat look like this, All right? So here. It doesn't really matter whether, you know, the local behavior here doesn't really see the fact that this is a sphere, right? So they would always somehow uh, look like this locally. Um, then globally for the long time behavior, I mean, you can make, you know, one can make guesses and one, one knows certain things because, what, I mean, one knows very well what the limiting uh, distribution is, right? I mean, so you, you know what is the invariant distribution for these. And so you know how it sort of concentrates around the closed geodesics. Um, so, and that, of course, then really depends on the global structure of your manifold, because different manifolds would either have closed geodesics or not have them. Um, so yes, yeah, so there you can say, you can say quite a few things, um, but not, so for the moment, I mean, so at the moment, this is very recent work, right? So it's essentially, a, this stage constructed the process, we don't yet have precise statements about the behavior. Also, I wanted to know about higher dimensional cases. So can you replace the rubber band, the one dimensional curve with a, uh, you know, like a surface or something? Yeah, so the, so the target manifold can have arbitrary dimensions. No, no, so not the, the target, but the one which you move. Sorry? The, the one which you move, which is... Uh, ah, kind of okay, so replace the curve by something like a surface. Yes, so that's a, that's a very good question. Um, and uh, the answer is no. So the, somehow this, this whole theory works for one-dimensional curve, and it breaks down precisely at two dimensions. In some sense, it should work at two minus epsilon dimensions, if that existed. Uh, somehow in terms of power counting, but at two dimensions, it's precisely where it breaks down. Okay, and, uh, and the, uh, the conjectures is that somehow, even if you can somehow make sense of that thing in two dimensions, uh, then it would probably really depend on the shape of the target manifold. In some sense, that the, the target manifold should be a symmetric space, probably, and couldn't be an arbitrary. Thank you. Hello, um, I was exactly here. I was wondering what goes into this guess of this local expansion. So, I mean, this seems quite 
sorry, what goes into this? Well, what kind of the thought process goes into? Oh, into uh, these. Uh, um, well, I mean, there are essentially terms that appear if you somehow just formally write down a pick high iteration for the solution to the equation. It's essentially the terms that appear in the pick high iteration, uh, more or less. That somehow, but then they have to be identified in the right way so that they, so that they have somewhat you know, sort of homogeneous behavior at different points so that they really behave somehow like monomials. Um, but it's relatively easy to somehow guess these terms if you want. But, I mean, if you want, I can show you in more detail. But it's, a, it's really not very difficult in some sense to guess. So you terms. have this on a slide? Or? Sorry? You said you could show it in detail, so you have it on a slide. No? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't hear what <coughs> you're saying, actually. Um, oh, okay, That's now right. I found out <laughs> where the I hear you. mic is. So you said you could show this, right? So um, do you have it on a slide now? or? No, I don't have it okay, on a slide. Then. No. Okay. I mean, I mean, show it on a piece of paper. <laughs> um, one other question. So this um, this object we get on the sphere, for example, what dimension does this have? This limiting object on which you showed in the video. So uh, I'm not sure what you mean by what dimension. I mean, for example, house or oh, house of dimension. Uh, so you mean the house of dimension of this? Yes. Um, well, that would be two actually. Yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. Okay. Thank uh, you. It, I mean, it's basically a Brownian bridge. So it, it really almost, you know, th these blobs somehow almost look space filling, right? So they are not quite, of course, but they, I mean, already on the picture, you see that they somehow almost look like space filling. And so they would actually have house of dimension two. Okay, so. thank you. Uh, in the spirit of, of yesterday's luck, uh, lecture. If you solve that problem up in your mathematics cloud, is there any relation down to the ground of reality? I think he, here the motivation is really sort of mathematical, right? I mean, it's somehow because it's a beautiful, it's a very natural object, and so it's somehow, you know, build the natural evolution on curves that's well given by, you know, a nice geometric. Uh, object. So the, the motivation here is really mathematical. Well, if there are no urgent further questions, we thank you again for this very nice talk. And let me remind you, tomorrow again, same location, but 7.30. And there it goes, taming the infinities, which also might be really quite interesting. So don't miss it. Thank you. <laughs>